Australia, at least the moister parts of the southeast and southwest, is forested, and those forests are dominated by a single genus of trees, eucalyptus. And as you hear, you'll hear they have fireweeds. Um, they just live for 300 years and grow for 100 meters tall. They're still fireweeds. They're highly competitive for nutrients and water. They're hard leaf, they're oily, and they've got lots of adaptations that promote fire. Giving forests that to newcomers appear open and crunchy and noisy and aromatic and dry. They're also good species for solid timber and pulp. And so this is a bit of a story about how far we've come in managing those forests. When I arrived in Australia, my first impression of the eucalypt forest was a, a green homogeneity. You look a little deeper, you learn to read the landscape, which is a self-taught ecologist, is a, is a skill you have to acquire. And you see a different forest structure or species mix. There's almost a thousand species of eucalypts across Australia and, and southern parts of Southeast Asia. Um, you see a different understory on virtually every hillside. And so the question comes up, why is the forest how it is? And you get somewhere with those traditional ecological drivers of ecology and soil and uh, topography and management history. But until you bring fire into the mix, you don't understand the forest. Fire is the fundamental driver and integrator of eucalypt forests. And understanding Australian forests is about understanding fire. Full stop. Managing Australian forests is about managing the risk of fire in the short term and its inevitability in the long term. Managing the fire itself and managing the consequences of that fire. Getting this right gives great opportunities for foresters. Forestry is a disturbance and there are frequent natural disturbance regimes to guide us. And that thinking is global. The relevant Alberta research experiment is EMAN, it's Ecosystem Management Emulating Natural Disturbance. In this talk I'm going to try and describe one step in the journey towards sustainable, ecologically driven forest management in southern Australia. The, the step forward that I'll be describing today was successful scientifically. I kept my job for a while. Politically, everyone was happy. Operationally, did great things on the ground. It met resistance from, firstly from industry, that resistance was temporary, it was pragmatic, it was dollars based, and we worked through that process to see a good outcome. It met longer, met the worst resistance from the environmental, non governmental organisations of the environmental movement um, and the community that they speak for and to and with. And my thesis today, I think, is that forest <coughs> management in Australia, and as far as we can take the analogue elsewhere, is being held back by a lack of community understanding of the need to maintain fire in our forests as their natural ecological driver. There's minimal social acceptance of the role of fire in forests. I don't expect to be new to you, but I'm telling you another story that helps drive that understanding. And this is, in spite of the situation that the absence of fire leads to forest change, to degradation, and to the risk and inevitability of more fire, a more intense fire. So I, I hope this talk will give another example of the journey to sustainable forest management and how that journey, and the journey to therefore resilient economic models for the industry sector, with the industry security, has to be a social journey in parallel to an ecological journey. 90% um, of it's ecology, 10% of sociology. I'm somewhat trained in ecology, I'm not trained in social sciences. That's a point I want to make here too as well. Um, so I'll end up with a point of saying, well, I think we need to go forward to the future, but don't treat me as anything other than having some experience but no expertise in the social issues. Acknowledgements to many people over the years who have helped my thinking advance. Um, to those listed there, but also specifically across in uh, other hemispheres, to Bill B.C. from Western Forest Products or its various successors, to John Spence here, and to Jürgen Bauhaus at the University of Freiburg in Germany. And I also need to thank clearly the Department of Renewable Resources here at the University of Alberta for the invitation. To all my friends and colleagues here in Edmonton for our discussions over the last few days and today and tomorrow. Um, and to you for being here. So when we talk about forestry, I think we know we talk about ecosystem management. I think that's now taken for granted. We know that silver culture, um, our management of the forest for our this has to be applied ecology or else the forest will go off on its own trajectory. I think it's also worth thinking that management is bounded by ecology. We can't ask the forest to do what it can't do. Um, you have to go back as far as someone like Francis Bacon to get that point. Uh, 
Francis Bacon didn't work by deduction, he worked by induction. He developed that approach. Uh, nature can only be commanded by being obeyed is a very useful thing to put on your whiteboard and leave there, I think. Uh, Bacon argued towards general laws of nature, but from an accumulation of anecdotal <coughs> experience, which is what the philosophers do as well. Not from an external hypothesis, which might be right or wrong, which you then use data to verify. But he built a body of knowledge, and I think that's what we're still doing in ecology. There is no general theory left of ecology. So I think we know that management is valid by ecology, and our own experience comes in to help us work out how. Now we're getting onto something that's at least totally a bit more treacherous. Forests are dynamic. Some forests are not so dynamic. Rainforests appear to be static in many ways. They're dynamic at very different scales. But the boreal forests, uh, high mountain forests, the burn, lodgepole pine forests, our eucalypt forests in Australia are classically dynamic forests. <coughs> Ecosystems depend and develop on the disturbance regime and recovery from that. And moreover, all the values that we attribute to forests, we, in the generic sense of the community, track forest development in different ways. Which means that we need a mixture of those developmental stages across the landscape to try and tick everyone's box. But the forest can't do everything for us all at once, all at the same time. The trouble is that the uh, I'll say society in general, or the community, or the media, or the um, others who haven't gone on this journey or have gone on different personal journeys don't always accept that. There's conflict around these issues. And while I'm putting a certain point of view, I'm not saying so that what I'm proposing has to be an absolute truth. Conflict is there because there are different value systems and different understandings of the world. Um, but the idea that we can only do what the forest lets us do, especially the idea that forests aren't just static entities, they're dynamic, um, isn't yet more generally accepted in the wider community for whom we are managing the forests. The dynamic nature, the disturbance nature, the fire-driven nature of eucalypt forests, to me, makes them great for forestry. You can steal some timber before it burns in a very simple analogy. There's a way forward by using the natural disturbance regime as a guide for our management. And management guided by that regime should be both efficient and effective. You need to do less, you'll get more out of the forest as it regenerates. That's a testable hypothesis. I think ecologically we're getting there, socially we're not getting there, and that's my point for today. Tasmania, it's a state province of Australia, not a separate country. Uh, it's small, it's six million hectares, and you can see the brown areas there are the reserves, the World Heritage Area and National Parks. Almost half the land now, and that's a few years out of date, almost half the land mass is now reserved. There's about 67% literally of the pre-European colonization forest cover still left. So we've got great forests, a lot of reserve preservation. We're not about to uh, lose our forest cover. We have, as here in Canada, both provincial or state and federal um, relationships in developing forest management. But the state owns the forest. The state holds the forest practices system. The Commonwealth can give us some overarching policy and ticks and crosses and exemptions from other laws. Um, but the underlying logic that's developed across the state and federal boundary is reservation plus management of the production area by prescription. And it's a system that I'm happy with. There's a lot of rainforest which doesn't burn in the cooler areas, the wetter areas, the more topographically sheltered areas of Tasmania. That's well reserved. There's also a lot of um, tall, wet eucalypt forest, eucalyptus. Tall meaning between 70 to 203 meters is our tallest tree. Um, so it is tall forest. Wet means 650, 700 to maybe 1500 millimeters rainfall. There's also a large amount of that reserve. That's also our major production forest, especially for soil levels. That's what burns. That's what burns intensely. And the dynamics of that forest have been worked out along for a long time. It, you start at the top middle there with some even age for the overstory canopy, mature eucalypt forest, dense understory that's come up. When that burns, which it does so very rarely, you need several years of drought and then uh, hot northerly wind, an over 40 degree centigrade day and an ignition source, the wildfire is intense. It kills, in some cases, all the overstory trees in a spot. It removes the understory, it gives you a good seabed for the uh, fire open the capsules to drop seeds on, and you get a wheat field, almost, of eucalypt regeneration happening underneath, and then a self-filling process that I'll go through. There are many other kinds of eucalypt forests around that have variants on this. 
that we have across southeastern Australia over a million hectares of some species of eucalypt that respond in this manner. So I'm talking about a major forest type in the wetter areas. Same thing in pictures. Mature forest is at the top, it burns, seedlings come back in the ash bed around the burnt rocks. And there's a 73-year-old oh, regrowth stand, a young regrowth stand, approaching some kind of commercial maturity. It's got a lot of biodiversity in it. That system I see as an ecologically resilient system. You push the boundaries of that system too far by excluding fire or by having too frequent fire, it'll change to another forest type. But within certain ecological bounds, that system can keep functioning. Add some variability for you now. Wildfire is spatially variable. Um, the green areas, which don't come up so well under this lighting, are areas where the fires, these are two recent Tasmanian fires, have skipped their fire skips. Sometimes topographically protected in wetter valleys, sometimes pure chance as the fire jumps ahead of itself, then loses energy at the main fire front. And those areas where there are um, species surviving the fire then reinvade the burnt forest as it regenerates. They're a very important part of the spatial variability across the landscape. Temporal variability, a couple of slides on this. Wildfires are classically, as here, episodic. They can be very large. Um, that's 180,000 hectares at the top left, left hand side. Um, area burnt in one year. Um, that's 1940 to 2005 across the bottom. And that's a, a measure of our total area. It's the wildfire area that we attended as Forest and Tasmanian personnel. Um, you can see it's very episodic. And the impact on humans is, is a subset of that. None of those fires cause any more than no or one deaths, except the 1967 fire, which is the second red column from the left, and 73 people died because that fire was in the Hobart summer. So the impact on humans is a subset of this episodic nature. Those fires aren't large. Um, I would uh, attest that the 67 fire, which burned about 200,000 hectares total, much of which was grassland, wasn't that large a fire. In 1998-99, over six weeks, <coughs> over 2 million hectares burned, which is a third of the island. And the way our fire management practices are going, the way the climate's going, we may go back to such large fires in the future. So very occasional, very large fires beyond our lifespan to accommodate are what the bush is used to, the bush is the forest in Australia. A block of land, this is um, several kilometres square <coughs> here at Wara, a long term ecological search site. The colour maps just mean the fire history of each site. So different fire ages played out on the spatial landscape, even if the average wildfire is about every uh, one to three hundred years. Some sites burn twice in that time, some sites don't burn for four hundred and five hundred years. So you have a great spatial array of different forest types. Most fires are stand replacing, but by no means all. And this is some great work from Tom Spees and others um, in Oregon, um, which I'll try and explain rapidly, showing that the proportion of your estate that's old growth, which is the left-hand scale, several thousand years of modeling on the bottom, depends upon the scale you're looking at your state. So the province scale of 2 million hectares along the top line there, whatever the fire dynamics are, even with some big fires, on average you get between 40 and 60 percent of your province forest can stay as old growth. As you drop the scale to the national forest scale or the regional scale, 300,000 or 40,000 hectares, individual fires play a larger part, cover a larger fraction of that area, and so the proportion of old growth you get <coughs> And then of regrowth as it comes back again, of course, the swings and roundabouts are larger. What that says is at any one point in time, you'll never have old growth forever, which we knew. For any one piece of your favourite forest one day it will burn. Is that a threat to old growth across the landscape? Not at all. The larger the view you get, the more you see many things happen at once. <coughs> so that the bounds of consideration need to be put on the table for any argument about forest preservation. Lastly, of course, the forest type you've got is linked to the type of disturbance regime. You can do the same thing for kind species, of course. The penultimate picture on the right, and the one to the left of it, are the tall wet forests with fire intervals around 100 years. More frequent fire is found in buck grass, more under dry forest, it accumulates less biomass, but dries out more, and so it burns more readily. Whereas rainforest on the right um, doesn't burn at all. So there's this pattern across the landscape of fire intensity, fire frequency, and forest type, even outside the wet forests. A perfectly acceptable but complex play of forest types across the landscape. Um, bushfire is inevitable. As I said before, each forest type is 
be plotting the resilient within the bounds of its gap fiber sheet. So, that's my quick romp, if you like, through Tasmanian fire ecology of eucalypt forests. Um, you drive through the bush, you see a green wall of trees, you stop, you look, you walk through, you find old stumps, you find fire scars, you look at the age structure, you know the species, you know something about the nutrition quality of the soil. You can begin to deduce the fire history of that site and that it's, it's, it's rebirth capacity. You need to have that fire understanding intimate in your understanding of the forest. Now the forestry component of, of uh, how I'm tell this story. Uh, the majority of our soil logs in Tasmania, and we, we get about 300,000 cubic meters of soil logs a year, to the last couple of years, come from wet forests. They come from those tall trees. Um, we might harvest 2 million cubic meters a year, and the rest um, is not of soil quality, because off to wood chips, especially with the older trees, of course, that don't have particularly um, intact centers. But to harvest, this forest is relatively easy, but to regenerate it, it needs disturbance. To get rid of that slash, to get rid of that coarse woody debris at the base, because to get the, the eucalypt seeds to germinate and grow, they need space from each other, they need heated soil to release nutrients and to change the fungal microbiome components of the soil, and also to kill browsers, both insect um, browsers and the mammalian browsers, who would otherwise take all the seeds. Um, so, a hot soil as produced from a very hot fire is called an ash bed, and that's where most of our germinates happen. We can get up to the German level, several hundred thousand germinants per hectare. Fire has a direct effect to promote seed germination and nuclear growth, but also via all those changes to the soil <coughs> chemistry. Um, and it also has those indirect effects I mentioned. It changes the fauna interactions with uh, the species you're after in the It changes competition with other vegetation components. And that intensity of regeneration you can get then creates the, the new eucalypt stand from a very high stem density, and that is then linked to the stand health at maturity. So I'll just show you a couple of data points again underpinning these stories I'm telling. Um, there we have a typical set of self thinning curves from both Victoria and Tasmania. Age of the stand will the bottom stems per hectare, starting at several tens of to even 100,000 hectare stems per hectare on the left hand side. The trees compete. They grow fast, they grow tall, they grow a few meters in the first year, a few more meters in the second year. And you end up with a very even stand, and eventually, after hundreds of years, a few lone trees. Is there selection during that process? You bet there is. So Brad Potsner has planted a dummy, set of dummy stands, with survival at the start, 100% on the left-hand side, and measured years after planting the self-thinning process, but they had separate treatments based on the genetics of the trees they planted. And the outcross trees, the ones that have been sexually resulting from seeds produced from a different parent, male parent to female parent, they were the survivors. Whereas the self species, where the, the bees that did the pollination and didn't stay within the same canopy, they've virtually all gone. So in other words, if you go in and plant you're something approaching your final stocking density at, for a remote forest at uh, three or four hundred stems per hectare, and hope that your three or four hundred seeds that you germinate in the plant will produce the right forest. No, you're going to mix, you'll get all the failures and the, the self crosses in there. That process of self thinning that needs a high stand density, that needs a fire to generate it, that needs millions of seeds per hectare, is part of producing a healthy mature forest. The story I'm trying to tell is that in many different ways, the fire event changes the forest in ways the forest is adapted to, whether it's nutrient cycling or in this case overstory genetics. Can't mimic that easily in any other way. Fire also produces habitat. The majority of the biodiversity in these rainforests, or the tall and eucalypt forests in Australia, um, is invisible. Uh, it's fungal, and the fungal biodiversity is something we know very little of all over the world. Um, it's invertebrate. We've got, I think, a race between the fungal biologists and the uh, beetle biologists to see who've got more species in our trial plots of borrow. They're both over 1,200 species now. There are 12 species of beetle and 1,200 species of fungi. Lots of mosses and bryophytes and lichens. So here we've got some large logs resulting from a harvesting of a burn. Um, and we've done species accumulation for the beetles that are in this sort of mud gut, yucky, rotten stuff in the middle of the log that stays wet through the most intense burn. And over six years there, the first sampling cycle, we've got to almost 300 species of beetle emerging from both old growth logs and regrowth logs, they're smaller, so they're slightly less. 
over the 200 year planned out for this experiment, we expect to get um, approaching 500 or 600 species of beetle there. So there's a lot of habitat produced by the fire. Nutrient cycling processes happen, carbon cycling processes happen, pedological processes happen. From these many hundreds of tons of coarse woody debris left on the forest floor after the fire. Okay, we'd like to copy that, please, to get some timber out and start the forest again. And in some ways, we can do it. Here's a couple of slides on the clear fairy, then I go on to the variable retention, which is our attempt over the last few years to add another ecological layer of integrity to the clear fairy story. CBS, Clearfield Bird and so Silver Culture. Take a cut block, 50 hectares, um, and light it up. Put a line of fire in the middle and around the edge. And if you light it up properly with enough fuel, there's enough fuel to burn there, you get a large convection column, you get you reduce the wind as the heat rises, and you can burn down to mineral soil or ash bed places that harvest block. Um, it's a skill I'm in awe of, it's something I would not. I don't know, I'm not a fire person in terms of the fire um, operator, but the ability to handle that fire and to corral that huge amount of energy without escape, and to send the smoke so high up in the atmosphere it doesn't go down the local um, school, it may not be New Zealand instead. That's an art that uh, I just said. It works in lots of ways. It's safe. You take away all the trees, there's no safety issues for the forest workers. It's economic, you get lots of timber and it's relatively cheap to do. It's effective, the stand comes back. Pictures of the same viewpoint over 13 years, we've got more recent ones of those, showing the eucalypts come back and over time much of the biodiversity will come back. No those qualifications. Socially though, it's a disaster. You know that, I know. Forestry looks destructive. Clear felling burning looks particularly destructive. And those whose value system says they don't want big yellow machines and people in the forest taking trees out. The environmental movement. Um, and for those who would, as I would to a certain extent, fear myself with some of the environmental movement, I'm making some general statements here. I'm sure you'll find many specific counterexamples. The environmental movement in general uses the site of the newly harvested coup to say, this is destruction, let's stop this destruction. So that was one driver in the late 90s for Forestry Tasmania, the state government agency that commercially manages our state forests, to look for alternatives to clear felling. The government said, help, please, we've got a problem here, find an alternative. At the same time, we were getting good scientific advice globally that clear felling and burning was not ecologically comparable to natural wildfire. It created larger gaps. It didn't leave standing dead trees. You look at Mount Wellington, the mountain that overlooks Hobart, Every day I'm looking to work and back, I can look at that and I can see the 97 fires, dead trees, reminding me, as the regrowth comes up beneath it, that that was a wildfire that produced that hillside. Clearfells don't do that. They don't move, leave Jerry Franklin's legacy species and structures. And therefore they also, especially the larger size cut block, disadvantage the late successional species, the rainforest elements that come in, the flightless species that can walk in. So we know it's not quite the same. So the question we were asked by the state government was is there, and by the federal government, was is there a harvesting system more ecologically robust than clear felling that's therefore more socially acceptable? Actually, they just asked for alternatives to clear felling, and that's how we phrased the question inside. I'm trying to tease apart an ecological answer to a social question. Let's see where I'm going. In the context, of course, of maintaining an industry flow, maintaining contractual arrangements, and keeping the whole thing as a practical forestry technique. The spiritual, uh, intellectual drive for the process taken here came from Jerry Franklin, Pacific Northwest, and from many others around the world, but Jerry's the guy with the hat on. He, with David Lindemeyer from Canberra and others, coined the idea, after the Mount St. Helens eruption, of biological legacies, stuff that survives the disturbance that adds rapid reinvasion potential and complexity to the new standard. Older trees with hollows, because we have no woodpeckers in Australia, so you need a fire to break a branch off to make a hollow for nesting vertebrates and worms. Horizontal dead wood, fire skips, patches, maintain some mature forest attributes and processes in the long term, sooner with a more complex landscape. Clearfells doesn't do, doesn't do that. No matter what reservation status you have outside the Clearfell, within the Cuban, if the Cuban's large, that's a significant area, 
We're dumbing down the forest, if you like, and very, and others gave us ideas for what to do. There's an example from our own data from Tasmania of distance in from a forest edge, the forest edge is at the left hand side, and seedling density of some rainforest species. The rainforest trees reinvade the coop from the edge, but only maybe 50 meters in, one tree height in. A large coop, therefore, is deported in the middle over a long period of time in those rainforest species, except perhaps celery top pine, which is bird dispersed. So again, we know that the edge, how close you are to a retained edge, is an important driver <coughs> of retaining the regenerative complexity in your forests. And retention forestry, which is what this discipline is now called, with variable retention in the generic system, is now the go. Um, well over a thousand peer-reviewed articles, uh, many meta-analyses, including by Sue Baker from Forest of Tasmania and the University of Tasmania, many large replicated research experiments, such as EMENT here and Warren in Southern Tasmania, applying different uh, configurations of retention to see what works for safety, economics, and ecology. Do you leave trees dispersed in aggregates? What do you do? What did the fire do? And it's applicable to many different disturbance regimes. It's applicable in the end way outside old growth. It's a generic way to look at how to handle native forest to keep its regeneration trajectory closer to the wildfire or, or wind or snow melt or whatever any other disturbance driver is. The Wara Silicultural Systems Trial in our long-term ecological research site, our LTO site in southern Tasmania, only one hour from Hobart, thankfully, we can get there a day and back. Looked like that in 1997. That's the Huon River at the bottom and the Nuka Road. And seven or eight years later, when we finished all the harvesting, the same aerial view, the same river, we've got a range of different cut blocks. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of those. If you look at the two at the bottom left, the polka dot ones, that was our first go at the system we eventually adopted, which is aggregated retention, leaving clumps of trees behind. Dispersed retention, which is um, down the bottom right, the DRM, unsafe with eucalypts, and the trees don't survive the regeneration burn. So what can you do about it? And a whole range of other um, organizational, well, of tree, tree organizational configurations testing. Note for the scientists here, I think there's two of you, Replication expert within site and pour between sites. So this is a model forest, not a fully replicated experiment. So we need to bear that in mind as we try and generalize some of the results. A whole bunch of criteria, six, were then applied across the various treatments. And I'm not going to fill this in, I'm just going to jump straight to our outcomes. But safety, productivity, uh, which is how much timber we got out, economics, the cost of it. Mature forest biodiversity, since that one was seen to be deported in the landscape. Silver culture, which is regeneration, and visual acceptability were part of the mix. I'll just go through two of those, just because I, I like to see these pictures. We used key indicator groups, and you can measure and monitor everything in this waste of time. It's much better to measure and monitor taxa that tell you a story, that actually have some spatial relationship in their abundance and distribution to the scale of the disturbance. So in the end, we just measured birds and lizard beetles and vascular plants because they're easy to measure and we have experts in those areas um, and they tell a story for us. And the synthesis across all those treatments for the first three years has now been published. As an example here, here are bird species responses to aggregated attention. And clearly, um, what we're going to see is that different bird species respond differently to the different solar projects. So we have four bird species there and each column is the same in each panel, the, the, um, the harvested area of the aggregated retention is the left-hand side, the middle column is the retained aggregates in the coop, and the right-hand side is the control forest. And you can see there's birds like the superb super ferry at the right, at the top left, they're open country birds. Of course they're going to come in to the harvested area. There's birds like the pink robin, real rainforest gully birds that were there in the control forest, that do not even like the aggregates. Hopefully over time as the regrowth comes back, the potential is there for the pink robin to come in. But that's a, that's a fail, as assessed in three years for that species in the coop. But the other two species, the present honey and the thornbill, do pretty well in the aggregates. The aggregate is large enough to provide continued habitat for these species, even early in the silvicultural cycle. And that's what we're after doing, providing at least some habitat. We also did computer simulations, a public assessment, uh, in a whole research project with the University of Melbourne. The top is actually a computer-generated um, 
It's a clear line between aggregated retention, aggregates and retained forest. And the members of the public who are in this um, social science trial click the top buttons and move the trees around and change the expectation value of the forest and change the species that were involved and actually work their way through what they liked. <coughs> but to analyze the data on acceptability, that's the word I'll come back to, of these forest treatments, we need to break the public into three cohorts, or else the data was just a mess. To stratify the data into industry affiliates, non-affiliates, and conservation affiliated, because those three groups responded differently, especially to the amount of forest that was retained. And it's obvious in a way, but the industry affiliated individuals in the brown line could see more value the more trees were taken out. They had a value system based on productive use of the forest and experience that the forest will come back in from a clear field. The conservation affiliated green line, of course, was pretty much the opposite. And the non-affiliated had a less, slightly less pessimistic view. Add information in the right-hand panel. A lot of information in about how the forest regenerates, about biodiversity values across the whole, a modelled 85-year, 90-year uh, harvesting cycle. And things get better, especially for non-affiliated in the middle part of the graph. The 30% value for forest retention is about what the aggregated retention provides. So we had some idea at least that education is important to get that, but also that some level of forest retention, here 30% on the far right, gave a lot better than no retention acceptability to a, a number of the parties involved. And we've repeated this whole analysis now at the landscape level to try and also investigate what arrangement of coops across the landscape is acceptable to people. Anyway, that was, those are just a little taste of the kind of analysis we've done. Don't look at the numbers, they're just to show that we fill the boxes completely. But the overall result has aggregated retention, the AR in there, comes out the most acceptable, um, and the, it is the preferred uh, sort of cultural method. Several years before this, the answer was obvious because it was safe. We still got some reasonable timber out, and you could see that there was going to be some intact stand retained on the coop. The other thing about aggregate retention is that it fails none of those criteria. So we went through that whole process, and that's being published as well. And as John said, um, we went through a large number of ways to try and get some validation of what we were trying to do. A big conference. Um, that's not the external science, and we have an external science people. That's our state and federal premiers busy agreeing on things. Out of one. A science policy document that was several hundred pages long, that's all available on the web. And lots of training of our own practitioners in how to. Because the next stage is, Let's roll this out across the landscape, guys. Let's actually do tentative scoops in real life. So enrolling the actual forest practitioners, the district staff, in the how, and then the last thing, but why are we doing this question, getting that story together, was the next stage. And we've done that. Verbal retention is now regularly used, routinely used almost, for public land, state forest, mature or old growth forest harvesting in Tasmania. Things have changed in the last six months because of the markets and other customer changes, so we're doing this harvesting. But nevertheless, we now have a, a large database of, of coop sites, all the, the blue sites there, across Tasmania. In other words, we've actually gone from N equals two coops at the research site um, to a real sort of cultural technique that works. What did we learn? A lot more from operationalizing it than we did from the research sites in, in some senses. We learned the V word, the variable word. Variable retention is variable. Variable means site specific. It's let the planners look at each individual coop and say, now what are we after here? What are we trying to retain? What do we want the stand to look like in 80 years' time? And they can begin their work to bring their local knowledge and advice to the researchers as to what's possible. A coop in the Sticks Valley there, and each of the retained aggregates, there's some island aggregates and some edge aggregates, are there for a particular function. And therefore, at the end of the silviculture and at the end of the rotation, we come back and say, how's that regrowth gone? Is that old growth still there? Is these rainforest trees developed? What's happened to that coop? We've learned we need to use a somewhat different burning technique. Um, the convection column doesn't work when it um, obliterates your aggregates in the middle. So we've developed equally hot burning, what's called a slow burning ground fire, where you lay a single line of fire down um, from a, from a chopper, between the, along the fairway between the aggregate and the retained forest, 
towards the end of the day, um, when the coops dried out enough after harvesting, but the forest around is, is getting damped up against the end of the day, the fire will burn out and self extinguish at the edge. So far, it's done that. The other thing I think I want to add is that we, without a specific slide, is that we, we moved away from, we didn't even go anywhere near retention as a parameter to measure for success. This is not about leaving more forest on the coop. In some coops it does do that. This is about working out what you're leaving and why. So if the coop already had some set-asides for that, that big riparian zone, for example in the middle bottom there, that we were never have harvested, um, or that uh, if there's a rocky knob, for example, it's not commercial, that counts towards our retention value. If it's got some tall trees, they'll be retained in the long run. We're not necessarily trying to retain more, it's about where we're retaining it. And our fundamental parameter came to be how much of a harvested area was within one tree height to the edge, was being influenced by that forest edge. Come back to that again. We look at these coops, it's not about so much the retention, it's about where are you retaining it, what's its configuration, how big are the gaps between it. And that thinking about shape is much more important than blindly retaining more forest because we thought we had to. Siding as far as beneficial or detrimental has been a challenge. We fell in our own trap when we first scorched this particular aggregate in Warren. It got burned too hard. We call that failure. It, half an hour later we realized, hang on, what happens after a wildfire? You get burnt forest. Standing dead trees are structure. Some of these trees will survive somewhere. So if we've got beyond the point of thinking everything needs to be left unburnt. This is that same sticks cooper form. And the bottom left picture there is of a burnt aggregate. The rest of the aggregate survives, so we're doing fine. And even that sticks coop, many of the trees have survived as well, because the fire wasn't that hot. So again, our knee-jerk reaction, even as hopefully trained ecologists, that the fire is part of the system, we can still fall in our own traps and say, oh, we've burned that potential. No, it can be okay. It can be a good thing. If you add structure to diversity. Last point before I'll try and draw some sociological lines together. How do we assess success? Both retention, are we retaining things that are important for mature forests in the long run? The top is the influence, that's that stick scoop again, and the yellow hatches is the forest, is the cleared area within one tree height of the forest edge. Tree height being 70 metres means you get quite a lot of influence. And we try to maximise that up to a certain point without diminishing timber flow. And lastly, connectivity. So when the fire breaks are that big, we're not doing the right thing. So three objectives, we had to articulate these in this manner after we've got the system up and running and make 12 metrics to score each coop for the local planners as part of explaining to the local folks why we're doing this. So a lot of this process actually happened after the research, during the operationalization. How do we measure what parameters do we use to tell the story for what we're doing? It's also fitted beautifully into our adaptive management frame. Don't go through this, but here's the three objectives down the left-hand side. Influence, retention by area, makeup, and retention by integrity, and habitat conditions and connectivity, with 12 different metrics for each. For a whole bunch of coops, this, this Excel spreadsheet goes on for miles to the right hand side, but each coop, about a year after harvest or less, was assessed according to does it meet that goal, very clearly not at all, inadequate, or whatever. So we're trying to get outcomes A and B. So we've got a system that the local operational district foresters can use that's full of ecological <coughs> metrics. And that works. They were really proud as a, as a team, as a cohort, to be doing the right thing by the forest. And foresters are, uh, it's a corny phrase, but it's true, essentially conservatives. Two examples from that. First, the integrity of retention. And then the four metrics under objective 2B, integrity of retention. If the aggregates are edge connected, it's great. If they're large, that's great. Minimise wind throw risk and don't burn too much. And we've moved over time to doing better. So this graph on the right is 07 up to 2010. We had some coops that failed. Up to now in 2010, all coops are 9 or 10 out of 10. So improvement over time, exemplified by this uh, coop in Ireland on the left and the kangaroo coop, we call it, of course, on the right hand side, where the aggregates are larger, or fire resistant, and connected to the edge. So we improve, that's an example of improvement over time. The other one I'll use is connectivity and habitat, a little new data here. You don't want to have too many area, area of fire breaks because fire breaks do not give good regeneration. The soil is too compacted, minimizing disturbance and so on. 
So this sticks cube on the left-hand side from a different viewpoint, those white lines around the edge are a brake pattern to bear a fire brake, which is great if you want to, for paranoid about fire getting into the aggregates, and you think the fire brake will stop it. We went through a long process to go to stuff on the right, where we're, we're moving away from those very intensely made constructed fire brakes. It's required a lot of education over time of district staff. So then actually, on the blow-up day, that fire break is 15 metres wide, will still not protect the aggregate, because the weather will drive the fire across, especially if you put the pile of debris you've produced just inside the fire break that will smoulder for a long time and carry fire into the forest. So teaching them about what's possible. And here we have the proportion of the Kubian fire breaks, left-hand side, from 07 to 2010. The blue lines are the variable retention, and the red is the control CBS Kubian policing study. The difference of 15% extra fire break to protect aggregates has dropped right away. So, adaptive management over time, working with an ecological theme by interaction with the real operational foresters, by enrolling them in what the goals are. What's also needed for this whole system to work is for the WARA, long term experimental coops, those two of them, to be ahead in time from the operational coops. So we can monitor those intensively and pick time points to measure things, taxa to measure, and apply those operationally. One of our hypotheses still, of course, is that the retained forest will influence the harvested area. It will promote recolonization. And here's an example after three years that dodgy because it's so young. It is really the kind of stuff we might expect to see. These are beetle communities, and these are beetles. And dots close together in this automation are more related communities of beetles. So the pre-logging and the aggregates are down the left-hand side of this two-dimensional space. The clear field stuff in the stars is on the top right. And the retained um, aggregates, the cleared area around those, the logged area of the area potential could be bright green, is clear the clear field, but over time it may well be starting to move towards the pre-logging state much faster than the clear field beetle communities are doing. So we've got ways of actually detecting whether the cleared areas of the, the variable retention cube are responding more rapidly to the retained forest edge than the bigger clear field cubes. So analyzing this kind of data gives us things to measure operationally, to say statewide, and we're not um, simplifying the forest the way the clear field would have done. Conclusions from the silver culture, into the second part. A spatially heterogeneous disturbance regime, that's good for landscape management, can come from variable retention. We're working within COOP. Remember that. If the COOPs are different, that helps. We can incorporate ecological metrics into planning. And we can have a simple monitoring of operational COOPs informed by our research angle site. It's a nice system, I like it. Note also that it's at one scale only, the within coop scale, which is the scale at which we were asked to do the work. Landscapes function at a landscape scale. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, but to flag that we are also thinking about multiple coop level. This is the map of, of the Warra Long Term Ecological Research Site and sites to the east. Everything coloured on that map is mature forest. The pale pink is mature forest a long way away from the next <coughs> mature forest. The red and dark red is mature forest close to more mature forest. So mature forest itself differs by its connectivity and its degree of isolation in the landscape. We we'll use that kind of metric to say, now this coop here is an area where there's lots of mature forest nearby. We don't need to overkill on the retention. But this coop here is an area of extensive regrowth. Any mature trees we can create in this coop are very valuable locally. We can begin to target tweaking individual coop prescriptions according to the regional nature of the forest age structure. That multi-scale approach complements and works with the larger reserve system that we have already through our forests. To start the transition to social comment now, the history of forest management in Australia, both <coughs> in Tasmania and Australia, is of course that paradigm for protection of forests against the destructive elements of the resource use is to reserve the forest. Uh, and when we have debates about forest management, the, the answer is always let's reserve some more. So all these things we're doing with variable retention, with reserving stuff within the coop, looking at how the whole landscape functions, tends to get ignored because there is still forestry activity there. So I'll just park that thought for the moment. 
The point of this slide is we are still working multiple scales. So, time for a Do we succeed or do we fail? Hence, you ask. Ecological benefits tick. Social research said yes, increased acceptability of those that we asked. Practice was transformed. The ENJ response was very clear, not acceptable. There's a quote there from the Forest Network, no real change for the trees or the animals. Because, essentially, they're seeing the cut trees, fire burnt area, and are not applying thinking to how the use of a cultural system will add complexity over time to the forest. It's a narrow window of consideration, the harvesting event, that's being used to make a judgment about the forest. We did advance the debate. The debate went from protect old growth forest to protect high conservation and the forest. So in a way we saved, we got a few years of benefit out of it, but then the debate just moved on to the next um, forest protection argument. I've got a number of good friends who are poets, musicians, environmentalists, who have a very strong heartfelt connection with the forest. You can't sensibly attack their values. I don't because I share any of those values. The Wild Angel show here was a particular forest protest of a, a young lady who dressed herself up as an angel, and dressed herself up as a cross, a cross an angel, logging road. If we'd had that protest beside the road, we'd have taken some photographs and kept going, but it had to come down because it was blocking this unsafe blocking track. So a lot of the artistic members of our community come from this space of seeing the forest today as something that is destroyed by our activity. And the missing link in that is their response to fire, so it's a powerful idea as well. Knowing how to engage with this cultural of the community is very difficult, of course. And so to compare ecological resilience to social resilience, we are, as an organisation, Forest in Tasmania, it's a state government entity, an imperfect outcome in that the forest debate wasn't ended. A good friend of mine once said to me, you make two mistakes in forestry, you ignore it, you try and solve it. Both of those are mistakes. You can't ignore forestry, you can't try and solve forestry. You have to work with the debate and continue over time. So any attempt to solve a forestry debate by a next big agreement, I'm suspicious of. Part of what we did wrong was not engage with the NGOs in the process. A lot of the work on the North West was relatively more successful. Uh, I won't talk about the Boreal Forest Agreement, I'm not um, qualified to do so. Anything that engages with ENGOs during the process has a greater chance of success, a lower risk of failure. It's a probabilistic statement because some of the ENGO values is still no tree harvesting. But if you don't engage with them, then that actually divorces yourself from saying that we have a community wide acceptance. The real driver, I think, to understand why this kind of protest is so potent is that the community has a negative view of the natural disturbance mechanism that we're emulating here in our silver culture, namely fire. 2006, Hobart, when that picture was taken, I was standing next to the, uh, um, a car, the top of the multi-story car park in the middle of Hobart, and there was fire in all four coordinates of the compass. That's Hobart Town and the bridge over the river Durban to the hills towards the airport. The airport's on the other side. Um, not a very serious fire. But in that moment, I was thinking, my kids, my house, the forest, what's happening on? I reacted to any human being would do it. I had to physically pull myself out of that space and also acknowledge that these forests burn. This is not necessarily a bad process. How are we going to manage it? Are we going to lose any assets? What's going to happen? But accepting that fire as a process itself is not something we should. Uh, we shouldn't disrespect it, we shouldn't really react against it. So most, I think, members of the community see fire negatively, for good reason, in many cases. Um, February 2009, we lost 173 people in Victoria in one night because of the bush fire. Fire kills people and it takes our assets away, we respond against that. People also respond to forests as static, not dynamic entities, and want them to be conserved, as though the fire will never come. Until we engage with that attitude, I think as foresters trying to manage systems of quantum natural disturbance guide, we're in trouble. One of the way forwards, and I don't have many much advice here, <coughs> one of the way forwards is to buy into the processes that tell the good story about wood, about timber use, about managing for carbon, the forest as a pump, not as a store. A store gets full, the pump keeps on pumping CO2 into the atmosphere. This is the Australian marketing campaign, Wood Naturally Better. It's an example of the kind of story we need to tell people in the community it's okay to use forest products by your value system. Not because we say so, there's some stories to, to give, 
but what is actually a, a valuable thing to use and what Tinder use is not this instructed for the environment as it's being told. It may be better than some other materials that have more, more embedded energy. My conclusions are, in a sense, are obvious. Um, I'll, I'll read the last paragraph here that I write. As, as, as forward-thinking New Age forest scientists, some of us are, I hope, we set up, and I think we still correctly, subscribe to the paradigm of emulating natural disturbance. It's effective and sufficient of modelling our forest management on fire, but we've fallen into the trap, I fell into the trap, of not thinking through in advance the social response to this paradigm. We built silver culture systems based on fire, but not realised we need to bring the community along as far as we can on this journey. The community is sensibly afraid of fire. Fire is lethal. To humans, it's destructive to the forest stand as you saw it yesterday. It's not destructive to the forest as a whole, it's destructive to yesterday's forest stand. And with, but with smoke, it's polluting to the atmosphere. So no wonder the community rejects forest management based on fire, forest management systems built around fire. Um, acceptability, the middle dot point there, I've learned, formally is about people's values and their beliefs about consequences. We can at least can educate about beliefs about consequences. And I think if the forest industry has a commercial um, stake in timbering structure, then I think it also needs to address social responses to forest management and buy into the social science research to understand how we can actually improve people's beliefs about consequences, improve beliefs about our own beliefs about consequences in the mix as well, but advance uh, the understanding of how forests actually work. I don't think we are necessarily entitled to try to mend the value system. I think that's everyone's individual responsibility. But we can talk about beliefs about consequences, and science, of course, plays into that space very well, as does education. Um, there's not that many social science research teams in forestry, and I think we need them as much as we need logical research teams in forestry. Thank you for your time.